what if you were connected to everyone in the world? How would your life change? What if you could see the patterns See the beauty. New ideas in science. Deepen your connection to nature, to the stars, and to each other. Learn to see the world differently. The Connected Universe truly see the universe when we open our eyes? Do we see the vast potential that's inside of us? First came fire, then came steel. And it wasn't long before we started asking some big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Some of the greatest minds in our history, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Rumi, Leonardo da Vinci, Michael Faraday, Max Planck, Nikola Tesla, and Albert Einstein all start to explore the big questions of life and our universe. Their collective work points to something very important, that we might be far more interconnected than anyone had ever thought. Their ideas were way ahead of their time, so they left hidden messages for others to find later, because in their day, they could only share their knowledge with a few people. We live in an age where we can communicate to every point on the globe. We are all connected, but it's more than just a feeling. It's also a mathematical equation. But the idea that we are all connected sounds like a platitude to many of us. We're more disconnected than ever in certain ways. War. Violence. Greed. Tragedies. These are the stories that fill the news channels, and this is a very disconnected view of the world. Us against them, you against me, danger and disaster lurking around every corner. But are we complicit in it? Because this is what so many people seem compelled to watch. Drawn to the worst aspects of humanity. And then there's the ever-increasing pace. Why do we race through life so quickly? Taking in disconnected message fragments with no voice, heart, or context. When we consume bite-sized pieces of information, it's very hard to imagine the big picture. Why does our world seem so frantic? Why do we spend so much of our time chasing money, career, intimacy and possessions with schedules so full when all we really want is simply to be together. For all of our progress, we've lost connection to the one thing that really matters. We remain disconnected while pretending to be connected. And being connected at a distance 
makes it easier for some people to say hurtful things. We have trouble staying connected to the ones we love. Let alone the rest of humanity. There is fear and there is beauty. Which world do we want? How we connect with the world changes our experience of the world. There is hidden mathematics that underlies all of creation. Nassim Haramein believes the world is profoundly connected. Our universe is filled with mystery. Our planets, stars and galaxies account for only 4.9% of the matter of the universe. So what makes up the rest of the universe? Is it dark matter? Is it dark energy? There is a large amount of unexplained energy in our universe. In 1992, the NASA Cosmic Background Explorer detected fluctuations in the background energy of the universe. To explore this mystery, we need to remember the words of Nikola Tesla. If you want to understand the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. There is a flow of the energy of the universe around you, and a flow of the energy of the universe inside of you. When people realize that everything is connected, the sense of separation, the sense that we're isolated, hopefully that goes away. And it's replaced with this feeling that we're part of this incredible creation in which everything is interdependent on everything else and that everything is connected through this energy that's in the space. And then actually it's the space that creates matter and reality and them. They're part of the whole thing. And so that they can see the incredible potential that they have, the incredible miracle that it is that they're alive and that they're able to experience this interconnectivity with everything. It's a feeling of resonance, and a feeling of connection with everything in the natural world. And maybe, just maybe, as a result of understanding this at the deeper level, they will start to understand themselves at the deeper level. And understand the functioning of the universe at the deeper level and that it will give hope to people. Could there be a scientific basis to the way we are all connected? Albert Einstein changed the world with one equation. Yet he knew that his greatest work, to create a single unified theory of the universe, was never finished. Einstein knew how important it would be to humanity if this could be discovered, and he kept searching for answers. But before he could solve it, he ran out of time. Others have built on the work of Albert Einstein in the search for a unified theory of everything. Some people have a knowingness of this connection between the macro and the micro. 
In the past, we've created mythology around it. But what if we could understand it through the lens of science? Nassim Haramein has been exploring how everything is contained in everything else. The exploration of the universe through mathematics and physics has been complex. Yet from this complexity emerges simplicity. What if there is a way of proving that everything is connected and one at the same time? To understand this, we must take a journey, and our journey begins with the proton. If you remember back to your high school science class, atoms are everywhere and the protons are at the center of every atom. Therefore, we must accurately understand the proton if we are going to understand the universe. New measurements of the proton suggest we must change our existing way of thinking. Nassim Haramein was the first person to have accurately predicted the new measurement of the charge radius of the proton. The proton could hold the key to a scientific understanding of how the connection of the universe actually works. Nineteen oh five. Einstein demonstrated through an example of a person traveling on a train the theory of relativity. He unified the separate camps of energy and mass with his famous formula. But later, a great divide in physics occurred when Niels Bohr and a group of physicists split off to explore quantum mechanics. They saw two worlds. A quantum world that describes the probabilities and the uncertainties of the very small and the separate mathematics for the larger universe. Creating this division led to a very disconnected way of thinking. Nassim Harameh, the director of research for the Resonance Science Foundation, has been on a lifelong search to discover a unified theory of everything. My passion for learning never subsided. As soon as I left school, I got more passionate than ever about understanding the universe, studying physics and mathematics and so on to try to describe it better and eventually to write a unified view of physics. To me it was critical that we understood the source of reality. We come here and we experience this life and most people don't ask like how did I get here? What is this life? How am I moving billions and trillions of atoms around? I was exploring all this for my own personal satisfaction. It really wasn't to get a master's degree or a PhD in some institution. I knew that if I went to the institution, I felt I was going to be restricted. I knew I was going to be given very specific concepts that I would have to go with. I didn't want that. I wanted to be completely free to think what I wanted to think as I explored. It led me down a very specific road. Certainly some of the things I thought turned out to be wrong, but eventually I started to home in on the stuff that worked together and I found something I think very fundamental and very profound. To understand how everything is unified, Nassim had to study nature. He had to look at patterns. He looked at the macro and the micro. He started asking questions about some of the fundamental principles science has taken for granted and started to wonder if, somewhere, we went off on the wrong track. As he continued his journey, he began to understand that in order to see how everything is connected, we had to look at everything. Everything 
we experience as reality is actually made up of 99.99999% space. The little part that's not space or the little part we define as something, the material world, is actually just a little oscillation, a little electromagnetic boundary that we are bumping against. And we call that our reality. We call that a stone, an atom. We call that the water, the sand, or a star, a galaxy. And so maybe instead of looking at matter, defining the space, I start to think maybe it's space that defines matter. It is fascinating to realize that if you remove the empty space in every atom of every human being on the planet and compress it all together, all of humanity would fit into the size of a sugar cube. Granted, it would have the density of a neutron star and weigh approximately 478 million tons, but this helps us to visualize the importance of understanding that every one of us are made of mostly empty space. But as it turns out, that space is not empty. It was found that space-time at the quantum level is fluctuating with intense energy level, full of dynamic energy components. We are not only talking about the space outside of our planet, we are talking about the space inside. Each and every atom of your body, every single human on this planet has this in common. Regardless of race, color, or religion, we are all individual beings, yet this dynamic energy of the universe is constantly flowing through all of the space inside each one of our atoms, connecting us all. This helps us understand the profound quote of the Sufi poet Rumi, who said, You are not a drop of water in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. You can literally feel the force of the universe inside you and flowing through you, connecting you to everything because you are a part of everything through this dynamic energy. The great theoretical physicist John Archibald Wheeler, a colleague of Einstein, said, No point is more central than this, that empty space is not empty. It is the seat of the most violent physics. The theoretical physicist David Bohm explained, Space is not empty. The universe is not separate from this cosmic sea of energy. And Albert Einstein said, physical objects are not in space, but these objects are spatially extended as fields. In this way, the concept of empty space loses its meaning. This underlying background energy that exists everywhere in space is described in physics as the vacuum. What if there was a way to connect to this vacuum energy rather than depleting our natural resources? Humanity is on a course that's unsustainable. For millions of years, magnetic fields have been around us without us knowing about them until Faraday figured out that by moving a little magnet across a set of wires we could get an electric power source that could power all of the devices we use today in our society. Now we are discovering there is another invisible field at the source of the material world that is all around us and in large quantities. And by learning how to tap into its structure, we could power our world for generations to come. Scientists from around the world are looking for a solution to tap the vacuum energy that is all around us. And it is important that they succeed. Current wars and potential conflicts of the future will be fought over resources like oil and water. Abundant energy will help create stability in the world 
and reduce the threats of the perceived energy supply disruptions that cause countries to go to war. War has been a big part of humanity's past. But does it need to be a big part of humanity's future? War has brought untold sorrow and suffering to mankind, and it is perhaps the strongest example of what can happen when we become so disconnected. Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. With our modern capacity to wage war, there can be no victors. Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, once said, the strength of a civilization is not measured by its ability to fight wars, but rather by its ability to prevent them. Learning how to harness this vacuum energy all around us could have profound implications but it will require a paradigm shift. Some of the greatest advances in science have come from people with the courage to pursue ideas that challenge the accepted wisdom of the time. It was common for these new ideas to meet with rejection at first. Galileo was in prison. People resisted Faraday because he had limited formal education. And do you know what happened when Einstein published his great works in 1905? Nothing happened. People didn't connect to his ideas. The only person who really saw what Einstein had done was Max Planck, who would become the father of quantum theory. Pursuing an independent path outside the academic world has been extremely difficult. It has been painful in many circumstances. The feeling of continuously being rejected, of not being understood, the constant interaction of fighting preconceived ideas has been a long road. However, it has forced me to be more accurate, to continue digging deeper and to be extremely careful about my calculations and how I bring them into the world. So it has served a certain purpose. Our material world is not as solid as it appears at the quantum level. As Tesla put forth nearly a century ago, we need to think of the universe as energy, frequency, and vibration, not as solid physical forms. We're not dealing with little billiard balls. We're dealing with waveforms, oscillations in the vacuum. Just like when we throw rocks into a pond and the rings come out, the rings can intersect and it doesn't destroy the waveform of one of the ring or the other. The two just intersect. And so that the spheres, the little vibrations of the vacuum are intersecting. And it is the holographic structure of space-time itself. It is the interference pattern that encodes the information of the whole universe in every point. The idea of a holographic universe was first put forward by physicist David Bohm, advanced by Gerhard de Hooft, then later expanded by Leonard Susskind. It was inspired by new understandings of black hole thermodynamics, that the information of the black hole is present on the 2D surface of the black hole, known as its event horizon. A simple example is that if you throw a wallet into a black hole, as the wallet is being consumed by the black hole, all the information contained in the wallet would become present on the surface of the black hole because it is a rule of the universe that matter cannot be created or destroyed.
Holograms are created using lasers to capture and encode the information of an object in the form of an interference pattern. The light reflected from the object is combined with that of a reference beam to create an interference pattern which can be retained on a photosensitive surface, creating a complete image that can be viewed in its entirety from all angles. The information of the whole is present at every point. When the hologram is cut in half, the complete image is present on both pieces. When it is cut again and again, every piece still contains the representation of the whole image. It is not the actual object, but a representation of the actual object in every piece. Nassim Haramein believes that the representation of the universe is encoded by the interference pattern of the fluctuation of space-time on the surface of every proton. The difference from the static hologram example is that the holographic information encoding is dynamically happening at every microsecond at every moment, and it is constantly flowing throughout the universe. We often hear the sentence or the concept, everything is connected, it's all one. We hear that from even masters in ancient civilization or modern thinkers, philosophers, spiritual people. And it's a great concept. For many people, it resonates as something true. But how is that true? Some of the work I've been doing starts to open the door to understanding the dynamics and the mechanics on how everything is connected so that it's no longer just a dogma or an idea, but it's actually based on the physics of reality. When I look carefully at the natural world, I found high level of coherency, high level of geometry, and as well, this interconnectivity, this interdependency of all things with other things. The whole system functions together in a balanced way. And I started to wonder, what is the source of this self-organizing system? What do you see? It depends on how you look. You could scan around an object and study it. Then you could look more closely using a microscope to isolate each part. In this instance, you would see millions of fibers and could spend a long time studying them. When you look too closely, you only see part of the picture. It is when you pull back that you see the part each fiber plays and how it is related to the others and then the bigger pattern emerges. Imagine the new understandings we will gain if we could all learn to think differently and to look at our world through a big picture connected perspective. Einstein believed that geometry was a key in the search to understanding the unity of the universe because it represents the relationship between things. Great thinkers came to discover the underlying geometry of nature such as the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence in many different forms of life. When Nassim Haramein analyze these geometric relationships in a changing three-dimensional space over time. He saw the 1 to 1.618 ratio appearing, known as the golden ratio or phi ratio, as a fundamental part of the structure of space-time. Leonardo da Vinci encoded this in his famous work, The Vitruvian Man, showing that the phi ratio exists in different proportions throughout our bodies, and it's not just in humans, it is in animals, in plants, and in art. Geometric symmetry 
even affects our perception of beauty. Spending time in nature teaches us that everything is interconnected and everything is interdependent on each other. We have a tendency to isolate systems and then analyze them as if they were not in relationship with anything else in the universe. So that many of our laws of physics starts with the statement within an isolated system. But then if you look up isolated system in a physics dictionary, you find that no such thing has ever been found. That is, nothing can be isolated completely from everything else in the universe. Gravitational fields cannot be isolated, electromagnetic fields and so on. So we need to write science that takes account of the relationship of all things with each other. I think if we want to find the fundamental principles of creation, we have to experience nature from an experiential base. And then the mathematics should come together simply and show beautiful results. It's too easy for scientists to get into the laboratory and just keep trying to work out the theory and lose contact with the natural world. When I'm out there surfing, I'm actually constantly being connected to these fundamental patterns of nature. The particles going up and down in the wave, the energy wave pushing me through the ocean, getting inside a barrel, the big vortex and the dynamics of the vortex. There is something very profound about that. Many of these things inspire me when I go back in the laboratory and start writing formulas. It's like it's in my cellular memory then. For many of us in cities, nature is but a faint memory. We are overrun by our technology. We give such importance to our digital reality that we sometimes ignore our physical reality at great peril. And it takes up so much bandwidth, affecting our performance and our well-being. We've let the noise of technology drown out our inner voice, which Nassim believes is the source of inspiration. We need to occasionally disconnect in order to reconnect. Some of the most beautiful times of my life were times where I was extremely isolated. So at that time, I was coming up to Whistler, Canada, more and more the interest I had in nature and physics and understanding the basis of reality was kind of taking over my interest. So I moved into a van to continue my research. I knew that if I could tough it out, minimize my expenses, I could get enough resources so that I could continue to work full time doing research, trying to find some clues as to how I could unify the forces of physics. And I was in this amazing research zone where information was just flowing through and I was researching and I was finding more and more information and the pieces of the puzzles were coming together and you know moments after moments of illumination oh my god you know oh my god oh my god one after the other and it was just so beautiful it was the most transformative experiences of my life and most of the physics I wrote I rode here. Of course, it took me some 25 years to flush out the math for it, but I knew I was onto something very early on. 
I was learning advanced physics and I was coming to very specific conclusions and then I was decoding ancient texts and ancient traditions that were completely confirming what I was coming up with in advanced physics and how the world comes to be and how the material structure exists. And many of these civilizations where these ancient symbols were present had numerous, thousands of different, very strange anomalies. Some of the things that are found around the world are not even reproducible with all the technology we have today. I felt that in these symbols, in these secret geometries, that these pointed to very fundamental understanding of the structure of space, of how matter is created, and how gravitational field can be controlled. It was my intent that the theoretical studies I was making would eventually lead to advanced technologies uh, that would allow us to control gravitational field and electromagnetic field in such a way that it could transform our civilization. Many in the Western world misunderstood the teachings of the Mayan culture and thought December 21st, 2012 was going to be the end of the world. However, the Mayan elders have said directly December 21st, 2012 wasn't the end of the world. It was just the end of the old cycle. Now we have the chance for a new beginning, a new era of connection, new understanding, and interestingly, on that day, December 21st, the end of the Mayan calendar, Nassim Haramein sent his paper to the Library of Congress, which for the first time ever connected quantum and cosmological physics. And the result of my equation was the exact gravitational mass of the black hole. That is, if I solve Einstein field equation to figure out the mass of a black hole, I would get the exact same result. So all of a sudden, I knew from the beginning of this exploration that I found something profound. If space is what's connecting everything, if space is what everything emerged from and returned to, then space is the great organizer. Space is the thing that connects all things, that gathers the information of all knowledge of every point in space. If we look at all the little fluctuations of the vacuum, the amount of energy inside the proton, in the vacuum fluctuation, the mass of the vacuum inside the little teeny proton in the center of an atom, is equivalent to all the other protons mass in the universe. That is, all the rest of the matter in the universe is represented holographically by the vacuum fluctuation inside one little proton. So that one little proton is connected to all other protons in the universe. Nassim's calculations seem to present evidence that our universe is holographic in nature. Another big question in our effort to understand the nature of things, is the universe random? Think of the amazing biodiversity of our planet, of all the living things. We live in a wondrous world. Think of the complexity of a chimpanzee. Consider a jellyfish or a blade of grass, or something less complex, something not alive, a simple Rubik's Cube. Three rows, three columns, three deep, with six colors. What is the mathematical probability of solving that by random chance? 13.8 billion years is the current estimate of the age of the universe. If you could send a blind person back in time with a scrambled Rubik's Cube, and they could make one move every second. How long do you think it would take them to solve it? In the 13.8 billion years of the existence of our universe, 
you would have less than a 1% chance of solving it. So how much longer would it take to ensure that you would solve it? There are 43 quintillion possible states for the Rubik's Cube. To move through every possible state without ever repeating the same one, it would take 1.4 trillion years. And you would have possibly solved it at some point. But it could have taken billions and billions of years longer than the existence of our universe to solve a simple Rubik's Cube by random chance. Now imagine the incredible complexity of a human being with 100 trillion cells that are communicating every millisecond to ensure all systems are go. Imagine all the moving parts, all the possibilities. How long would it take to organize that? Because we are so vastly more complex than a Rubik's Cube. Yet humanity exists. So how can this be possible? What if we could tell the blind person something? If we give just one little piece of information, yes, you're going towards the solution, or no, you're going away from the solution, then within a few minutes, the Rubik's Cube would be ordered. So from billions and billions of years to a few minutes with one simple feedback of information, that gives us a clue about the probabilities of how the biodiversity and the structure of cellular systems and all of our complexity that occur could have come to be with one simple feedback in the structure of space itself. Our universe cannot be purely random. There must be a feedback mechanism in the flow of the universe. Further evidence that this must be happening can be seen in fractal mathematics. For thousands of years, traditional mathematics mostly described man-made objects and motion. It could describe a pyramid or a column, but for living objects like a flower or a tree, you need fractal mathematics. Fractal mathematics are the underlying patterns that build the natural world. The great mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot created computer programs that use fractal mathematics to render complex forms. When Hollywood wants to create a whole new world in a science fiction film, a new planet, new plants, and new life forms, they use animation based on fractal mathematics to create a complexity of the natural world. To describe nature using math, you also need a feedback loop called iterations. If you start with a simple form, then iterate the formula, which means the formula feeds back on itself. You can see the complexity grow with each iteration. It is fascinating and beautiful to watch. When you make tiny adjustments to the formula or to the base form, you can create vastly different results. The possibilities seem virtually limitless. Witnessing this incredible variety and complexity helps to understand the vital role that the feedback mechanism plays in our universe. What is consciousness? What is the experience of being self-aware? In order for such thing to occur, there must be a feedback of information. For instance, you looking at yourself in the mirror, knowing it's you. What if consciousness is actually a function of how space feedbacks on itself, which would be a dynamic that could generate self-awareness? Us feeding information to the structure of space-time and space-time feeding information back in terms of our experience every day. This feedback mechanism could be the source of the self-organizing system that we see all around us at the biological level and eventually becoming self-aware or conscious. 
this being the very extension of space-time looking back at itself and learning about itself. Starting out in the world, when we first gain consciousness, we learn to take in information from all around us, from parents, from books, and now from technology. We are living in a time of information overload, and we are being bombarded by messages from everywhere. We have almost infinite choices of what messages we consume. It matters a great deal what you focus on. We know the universe has a feedback loop, and our brains have a feedback loop as well. Our thoughts are not only imprinted on the universe, they also deeply affect how we experience the world. The gift of being conscious is the ability to feel the wonderful moments of life. And it also means that we feel the painful moments. As you get older, you realize that good times don't last forever. And neither do the bad times. Because our brains have a remarkable ability to adapt. We can learn to shift our focus, to change our experience by changing what we put into our feedback loop. Gratitude and positive thoughts can build on each other, creating an upward spiral by connecting to your friends and to nature. You have the power of the universe inside of you, and you can overcome anything in life. Remember the age-old words, this too shall pass. As an individual, you put your thoughts and intentions out into the universe. And through the feedback mechanism of the universe, the collective energy of everything flows back into you. You are in a constant cosmic dance with the universe. The great poet Rumi said, Stop being so small. You are the universe in ecstatic motion. As individuals, we are powerful. But we have even greater power when we dance together. When we collectively focus our energy when we share and focus the flow. The flow of energy is real and we can feel it. Some people have learned to connect in their inner journey through yoga and through meditation. Some people's only experience of this is cheering at a major sporting event with tens of thousands of other fans, cheering for a common goal, which is enjoyable, but it is capable of being so much more. Humanity is able to accomplish amazing things if we come together on a global scale to create positive change and elevate our collective evolution. You matter in the universe. You are part of the cosmic flow. I think that every person is an incredible miracle and every person is critical to our evolution. Your body is an incredible example of interconnection and synergy. All the systems working together without even a conscious thought. In concert with your brain. Your brain may be one of the most amazing things we know about in the universe. It's doing billions of operations per second and doing everything it can to keep you alive. If you take a moment to connect to your body and appreciate all the invisible processes it does for you, 
It heals your cuts, helps fight disease, gives you energy. What if you stop being judgmental about the appearance of your body and choose to love your body for the incredible miracle that it is? How do you think your life will change? Your body is the vessel by which you experience the world and the universe, and it allows you to be part of the cosmic flow. If people understood the miracle that they are, they would never be down on themselves. They would never feel like they are, you know, less of. They would realize that they are part of an incredible will work of nature that they have access to and that they have power in this universe. They can do things, they can transform things. They can transform themselves and as a result, transform the universe. famous mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot proved that the smaller the unit of measurement that you use, the more accurate your final result. This is important to the work of Nassim Halamein because he uses the Planck units, the smallest unit of measurement available in the universe, in his calculations, which leads to an unprecedented level of accuracy. So, how incredibly small is the Planck unit? In order to give you a conceptual notion of the relationship in size between the Planck and the proton size, if the Planck was a little grain of sand, then the proton would be the size of the distance between the Earth and Alpha Centaurus, an enormous bubble that spans large amount of space, some four light years across. And then fill it with grains of sand. That's how many Planck units are in the proton. Imagine every grain of sand on the Earth would just be the tiniest speck of the number of Planck units on a proton. Not only does this show how small the Planck unit is, but it also shows how many Planck units fit in a proton. Haramein calculated that all the little Planck pixels add up to all the information of all the other protons in the universe, and that the fluctuation of the Planck oscillators creates the information network that the universe uses to get constant feedback. Einstein was fascinated with light and how it worked. His famous thought experiments would lead to several counterintuitive ideas that would forever change our world. One of those ideas was his theory of relativity. Einstein's general theory of relativity explained gravity as a consequence of the curvature of space-time created by the presence of mass and energy, and that space-time could be calculated through geometry. It literally acts like a fabric that stretches and bends. When you put lighter objects near a heavier one, they spin in the gravity well created by the large object. Einstein saw the fabric of space-time and gravity as continuous. Haramein sees the fabric quantized with a sea of almost infinitely small Planck pixels. So it behaves like Einstein's fabric on a cosmological scale, but the big breakthrough is that because it is made of tiny quantized Planck pixels, 
It allows for the forces of spin and gravity to be accounted for by Haramain's geometry at the quantum level. If you think of the water in a perfectly still kitchen sink, it could look like a single sheet of water. But if you pull the drain, the water spins around the drain while the rest of the surface is perfectly flat. This is how Haramain's work gets results like Einstein's single sheet. Yet because the water is really tiny individual drops, it allows for spin to be present at the quantum level. The other difference is that we can't think of it as a single sheet. Think instead of it being stacked infinitely high and infinitely low, infinitely right and infinitely left in a giant Planck pixel soup that fills the universe allowing spin to occur anywhere. Einstein geometrized space-time at the cosmological level, and until he died, he believed that there were gonna be a solution to do the same at the quantum level. So I was very much inspired by that. As Einstein was fascinated by light, Haramain is relentlessly fascinated by the forces of spin. Everything in the universe has spin. And I came to conclude eventually that the fundamental torque that produces the spin comes directly out of changes in density in the structure of space itself. Just like a little change in density between hot air and cold air produces a hurricane, which if you look carefully, looks a lot like a galaxy. The same forces are generated in the structure of space itself because of a gradient or a change in the density of the energy of space. The structure of spin is critical to our understanding of the dynamics of the universe. Think about all the ways we are spinning. The Earth spins at about a thousand miles per hour at the equator. The Earth spins around the Sun at about 67,000 miles per hour. The Sun, with our solar system, is spinning around the galaxy at 515,000 miles per hour. The galaxy is moving through the universe at approximately 1.3 million miles per hour. Our DNA expresses spin. Atoms spin. Protons spin. Everything in the universe spins. Spin may be the one thing that connects us all. We are living in a universe where everything inside of it spins. Seeing the interconnection of all spinning things made Haramain look at gravity in a different way. Gravity is one of the most mysterious forces in the cosmos, which is why so few quantum models include gravity. This is part of the reason for the disconnect between the quantum world and the cosmological world. Haramain asked the question, where is the best place in the universe to observe the most intense interaction of the forces of spin and the force of gravity? The answer? The edge of a black hole. Haramain has studied the possible connection between the forces of spin and the forces of gravity being intertwined at a quantum level. The spin dynamics of the structure of space-time itself is what produces what we call the black hole. And this new equation proves that. It proves that it's the Planck fluctuations that produces the effect. The black hole is actually the result of the little Planck's vacuum oscillations dynamically, collectively organizing from this new perspective, we start to see galaxies in a new way. Haramain's theory predicts that there may be a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. It would be almost like spinning a coffee in the morning, where the coffee is completely black, a very dark black coffee, and you can't actually see the spin very well. 
But as soon as you put the cream in the coffee, all of a sudden the spin appears. Like the stars and the dust and the electromagnetic radiation in a galaxy makes the spin that's already present in the vacuum apparent to us and we go oh look there's a galaxy with a black hole in the middle where the black hole and the structure the spinning galaxy are actually present prior to us being able to see it universal black holes these huge giants in the middle of galaxies and quasars and so on are actually the same dynamics inside a teeny object we call an atom. And uh, when we're looking at a proton or the nuclear of an atom, we're looking at the same structure, the same dynamics of black hole, uh, but in a very teeny object. Leonard Suskin, the director of the Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics, who is best known for having won the black hole war with Stephen Hawking on the information paradox, stated in a mini lecture series that there is no sharp separation between particles and black holes. Many physicists, including Leonard Susskind, are independently exploring new understandings of black holes. Haramain's proposed connection between the black hole forces and protons could prove highly significant. We're made out of these objects. We're made out of protons and atoms and molecules and all this. And so it would stand to reason that the same kind of dynamics should be found even at the biological level. And that is what creation is. It actually emerges from the vacuum through the black hole structure into our reality. New studies have shown that the spin rate near the surface of black holes seems to be very high. They spin close to the speed of light. His theories from 20 years ago predicted that result. These are all components that tells us that the black holes are not the result of the material world, but maybe that the material world is the result of the dynamics of black holes. Information and energy flow throughout the universe. For many people, the science of the interconnection of the protons is exciting because it resonates with the feeling of the connection of life. We feel the connection of life very deeply with our loved ones, our families, our pets, with the animals, with the amazing flow of nature and our connection to the natural world. Since our earliest beginnings, Humanity has depended on the sun and the stars for food and navigation. The drive to understand the forces of nature at work in our world has pushed humanity ever forward. For millennia, humans have looked at birds and dreamed of flying. But for most of human history, flight was considered impossible. What is the next great advance in flight? The structure of space-time is all around us. Imagine if we can learn to influence these structures so that we can control them and make them work for us. Gravity is a result of these little fluctuations in the structure of the vacuum. And by controlling those, by influencing those, we could be able to levitate things. Some incredible possibilities open as soon as we understand these fundamental mechanics of gravity and learn to control them and influence them. There's over 50,000 flights a day 
Imagine if all these flights didn't require fossil fuels. Imagine the positive environmental impact this would have on our society. However, in order for us to evolve to a society that's able to fly maybe through its solar system or even through its galaxy, our technology, our understanding of the forces of nature such as gravity have to go to a deeper level. The helicopters behind me produce massive amount of lift by creating these small pressure differential and generating vortices in the structure of the air. Now imagine what we could do if we could create the same type of depression or the same type of gradient change in the structure of the fluctuations of the vacuum itself. The space would curve and generate what Einstein described as gravity in space-time curvature. By doing so, we could control the gravitational field. Is it possible to create a gradient in the structure of the vacuum itself? We already do this with the Casimir effect, where we create a little gradient between the two plates that forces the plates to get pushed together. And now um, we've succeeded in doing what's called the dynamical Casimir effect, where actually instead of using plates, we're using little semiconductor uh, mirrors and we're able to oscillate them really fast. And as a result, we're able to like pop little photons right out of the vacuum. So we're actually already extracting little bit of energy directly out of the vacuum. This opens incredible possibilities. Tapping into the network of the structure of space leads to space travel across very large distances and so on. We have already sent probes past Pluto and out of our solar system, and Hubble has peered into the unimaginably vast reaches of space. And we have come to realize that we are connected to it all. Your connection with the universe began long before you were born. Did you know that the atoms and elements of your body were forged in the hearts of stars? Carbon? nitrogen, iron, and then when that star exploded, they were spread throughout the universe. The atoms in your foot may come from a different star than the atoms in your hand, and different from the ones in your heart. We are connected to the stars in a profound way, literally made of stardust, individual examples of a living, connected universe. Our mountains have watched humanity rise. Yet, what have we risen to? Are we at our best? Are we capable of so much more? Imagine if we open our eyes to new ideas, the heights to which we could rise, and make that journey for ourselves and for all of humanity Because we are all one. It has been a long road to get to the place where we truly understand the concept as above, so below, as within, so without. And that the forces of black holes are present in something as small as a proton. This changes the way we see the unity of our world as the dreams of our future take flight. This becomes an equation for a more connected humanity. Einstein believed that a unified equation should be beautiful in its simplicity, containing no free parameters. 
This is Nassim Haramein's equation. It contains no free parameters, and it solves for mass and gravity, both at the cosmological and quantum scale, with simple geometry and algebra. I took the radius, I calculated the surface, I calculated the volume, and then I divided by the little Planck spheres to figure out how many is inside and how many is outside. So that the outside was denoted as eta in our paper and the inside as capital R. And then I just did R over eta. I just looked at the relationship of the inside information to the surface horizon information. And I got a ratio. And eventually, I multiplied that ratio by a mass, the Planck mass. And the result of my equation was the exact gravitational mass of the black hole, just by basically pixelating the inside and the outside of the black hole and looking at their relationship. So all of a sudden, I was getting a solution to gravity, the solution to Einstein field equation, a solution that is based on holography, but not only that, a solution that's based on little Planck pixel, so that it was quantized. Einstein said we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Creating this bridge to unify the great divide in physics is an important step forward in advancing a more connected view of physics. So in the paper that I wrote and I, I sent to the Library of Congress for copywriting in December 2012, I make this little prediction that the radius of the proton should be exactly this value. And I state in the paper that more precise measurement in the future may confirm this theoretical result. I started to work on getting the paper published and sending it to colleagues around the world. I was getting very good reviews on it from very advanced physicists. And then all of a sudden, a paper was published. On January 25th, 2013, a new muonic measurement of the charge radius of the proton confirmed Haramain's predicted value. The experimental results were not what the quantum world wanted to hear. The measurement came in at 4% smaller than what was expected by the standard model. And so it was very difficult for the scientific community to accept this measurement. Nassim, you're on Yahoo Finance News. What do you think about that? Oh my God. Changing <laughs> the paradigm as we talk. History in the making. New connected universe theory offers an alternative explanation of gravity and mass, revealing potential new source of energy. That's big. Look, it's in the middle of the day. I mean, the night. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really awesome. Oh, my God. It's incredible. The wire went out, and within minutes, it was picked up by some of the largest networks and media on the planet. And it's already across the world. India, um... Germany, I mean, Europe is coming online. The East Coast will in the next few hours, I'm sure. I just feel like, okay, we're making a significant difference now. We're, we're really kind of birthing a new paradigm, a new moment in the history of science and the history of uh, understanding of the universe on the planet. Some 30 years I've been visualizing this moment where my work would appear on major news feeds all around the world. I mean, we got a lot of, a lot of pickup on this news feed. Today's the day. And it's kind of strange. It's a strange feeling. It's like, oh my God, 
it actually happened and you know it seems like a day like any other day but it, this is the day that it happened and this could very well be the day that uh, science changed forever but so far it hasn't been the day that science changed forever looking back through history and physics this is a pattern that has been repeated time after time after time. Someone comes up with an idea that later will become standard, but at the time, nothing happens. And sometimes there is massive criticism about the idea because it's a different way of thinking. We are only now discovering some of the unpublished works of Sir Isaac Newton. He didn't share all of his work because it went against the religious dogmas of his time. It's a little bit like steering a large ship. The wheel gets turned, but there's no immediate change of direction. In the world of physics, it can take years. After he first published his paper, Haramain was invited to share his knowledge with one of the largest laboratories in the world. However, when the administration found out about it, that invitation was cancelled because they were focused on looking for a solution in a different way. After 30 years of work, believing that this would be his moment, history is again being repeated, that potentially a big leap forward in our understanding is not being recognized. What I'm most afraid of is that the world will misinterpret what I say, misinterpret who I am, and um, continue on their self-destructive path they are on today. And that this incredible opportunity in our civilization we've had to grow and to evolve to a galactic community will be missed. I hope to be able to inspire people to think differently to not be afraid to be who they are and not to take everything they thought in the school or in the media or anywhere else just as a given, but actually to question what is being said and the validity of it and to do it in a way that is constructive and that leads to higher understanding and higher levels of creativity and I hope that my path and all this exploration I've done can inspire people. Science doesn't always change overnight. The Greeks theorized about the existence of atoms 2,000 years before we could actually detect one. The cover of Scientific American states in huge bold letters, the proton problem. Could scientists be seeing signs of a whole new realm of physics? For physicists, the measurement of the charge radius of the proton is fundamentally important to the understanding of our universe. When the first measurement came out in 2010, it was significantly different than the standard scientific thinking of the day allowed. They said there must be a mistake, that there must have been an error. So when a new measurement was done using heavier muonic particles, which would allow for even greater accuracy, the results were even more shocking. And so immediately I purchased the paper confirming the correct radius for the proton and that no errors were found in the earlier experiment. And so I took that number, I plugged it into my equation, and it outputted something remarkable. I was so excited to find that now my prediction is within one standard deviation of their data. And so evidence is supporting that actually our theoretical result might be the exact radius of the proton and experiments are slowly creeping towards it, confirming the theory very strongly.
standard thinking says that there are four fundamental forces in the universe. Gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force. But the strong force and the weak force were theorized before we understood about black holes. From my study of black holes and scaling laws of black hole structures in the universe, I found that the proton, or the nuclear of an atom, could act as a mini black hole. If you describe the little proton as a black hole, all of a sudden you calculate the gravitational force of two of these little black holes attracting each other, you get the exact force that we call the strong force that holds the nuclei together. Exactly. Not like approximately, but exactly. The strong force, that force that we actually invented out of nowhere because we didn't know how the protons held together, because they're positively charged, right? They're supposed to repel. So when we discovered that, we invented a force to force them to be together. And we said gravity is too weak to do the job. So we invented a new force. And since then, we can't get gravity and the strong force to like be nice to each other. And that's because we invented one of them. <laughs> Since then, we've ran like supercomputers, night and day, billions of dollars of investment in supercomputing power to try to find an analytical solution to the strong force, to LQCD. Zero solution has been found to this day. So maybe it's wrong, bro. <laughs> Try that. Because these little protons are spinning very rapidly, when we move them away from each other, this very strong attractive force drops off very rapidly, which is what we call the Yukawa potential. Out of the geometry emerge an exact solution to the force necessary to keep the protons together. And out of that came out the spin of the protons. And from the spin, I'd extrapolated the range of the gravitational force of protons to one another. If they were mini black holes, that force would be completely eliminated. We wouldn't need the strong force because we would realize that it's actually the gravitational force acting at the quantum level. So, I am able now to account for the strong force with a gravitational force and eliminate some of the largest complexities in quantum theory and reduce the number of fundamental forces in the universe. What really keeps me going, this amazing transformation I can see when a person realizes that they're connected to everything and that they matter in the universe. We live an imprint as we go in our daily life in the structure of space-time itself that we're informing the structure of the vacuum and so that nothing would be the same if we weren't there we're actually participating in this incredible complex will works of nature and that the communication of all the things in it is occurring through this imprint that we leave on the structure of space-time as we go along, as we interpret what we see and how we feel. And so we have a responsibility uh, in our interpretation and our feelings and our behaviors in what we are feeding the universe. So what do you want your imprint to be? You have the power in every moment of every day to choose how you feel and to choose how you show up in the world. Your choices matter in your own life and the lives you affect all around you. We can look at the world through the eyes of a child again. Filled with wonder 
Imagine, create, explore, and question. Our heart is how we feel all the things we can't see. And when we integrate the power of imagination with the love and strength of our heart, our world will change. Bringing hope for a better future. And this requires action. We already know about the feedback loop of the universe that creates reality. But there is also a powerful global technological feedback loop in the form of the internet. We consume content, but we also contribute content. Status updates, pictures, tweets, blogs, and we like, we react, we comment, and we share. This is a perfect example of a feedback loop. We live in an age where we can help each other solve problems like never before. One person has a problem, solves it, posts it, and we can all benefit from it with a few clicks on the web. Scientists from around the world can collaborate remotely and give each other feedback like never before. We are living in the most technologically connected time in history. So what are we going to do with this opportunity? Technology is a double-edged sword, and it can cut both ways. Many people think technology alone holds the key to creating a better future for humanity. But there is more to it than that. It is the consciousness with which we create and wield that technology that will significantly impact our world. And the choice is ours. We can choose to do more than just use technology to understand the mechanics of the heart. We can choose to listen to our heart, to connect to it, to be inspired by it, to learn to follow it, and to learn to use it to the fullest. Our heart is part of our grand connection to the universe. Together, we have the power to raise consciousness globally. We can make kindness go viral. We can actively contribute to creating a world where we focus on the good. We can renew hope, create solutions, and we can share old wisdom and new ideas. It would be hard to explain to someone 40 years ago the incredible impact of the simple connectivity of the Internet and how it changed nearly every aspect of our lives. It is hard for a young person today to imagine how the world used to be, because everything is changing so fast. Can you imagine what the future will be like in 20 years? Where will science take us? What will our technology look like? What will we learn when we stand inside a virtual reality proton and observe and interact with 3D visualizations of real-time experimental data? It's really exciting to see the interest that this new theoretical understanding is bringing we're collaborating with industry and have now state-of-the-art laboratories to produce technological advancements that are critical for the evolution of our planetary system and our society, including energy production, gravitational control, and all these things. So a lot of incredible things are happening and we're making great strides in achieving a whole new level of understanding of our universe, our self in it, and a whole new level of technology to go along with it. It is estimated that human knowledge took 1,500 years to double for the first time. Then by 1900, it doubled every 100 years. By the 1940s, it doubled every 25 years. And in 2013, it is estimated that it doubled every 13 months. And that time span continues to get shorter. But knowledge alone isn't wisdom. Leonardo da Vinci said, 
learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. From this place of connected understanding, he became very prolific across multiple disciplines, making innovations in science, in anatomy, in biology, in engineering and in art. Da Vinci and the other great masters have shown us that we no longer need to go through life with blinders on and look at things as separate. We can all learn to expand our vision and see the beauty of the connections that are all around us. And we can build bridges connecting our different disciplines and integrate our knowledge from a higher perspective. Those very important moments where you read something or you look at it, a theory that's being propagated by the establishment. You have a choice to accept it as a truth and completely ignore what may be going on inside of you that may be saying something different. Or you might reflect on what you've learned. Take what you think may be correct and maybe see how you could add your view to it to transform it. For the last 30 years, Nassim Haramein has been willing to ask questions and explore new ideas. And this journey has yielded ever further advances. Now, his work with Dr. Amira Val Baker has led to being able to extend his holographic mass solution to accurately predict the mass of the electron, the hydrogen bore atom, and all the elements of the periodic table that make up our physical reality with an unprecedented level of accuracy. One order of magnitude more precise than the standard approach is able to predict. All of these innovations are yet another step closer in helping us to usher in a new era of unified physics. We live in a time of great possibilities. We're all in this world together, and we are stronger together than we are apart. We have the opportunity to unify, to imagine the change we want to see in the world, to advance our collective evolution, and advance our approach to science. We can imagine the world from a connected perspective, to see ways to create new ideas in science, health, business, and in living more connected lives. Many people around the world are experiencing a feeling and a knowingness that something incredible is happening, that there is a great shift in consciousness taking place, and that people are awakening to the idea that the disconnected worldview can transition to a more connected way of being. This supports some of the most advanced philosophical and spiritual concepts that we find throughout the ages. From masters that have come and told us that everything is connected and we are all one. They told us that there is this background energy which is the force that creates stars, planets and life. Science is showing us that there are infinite possibilities to explore in the vastness of the universe. And you have almost infinite possibilities to explore within yourself. We can create a new future for ourselves, and we can co-create together a positive future for humanity when we explore our connected universe. Shalom.